Good to have you all with us here at our I think, third, third annual uh, Reformation Night. I uh, have the privilege tonight of opening up the life of William Tyndale, a very godly man that the Lord by His grace used uh, in the early days of the Reformation. Um, let me just begin by giving uh, credit where it deserves to be given. There's nothing that I'm going to be telling you tonight that is uh, originated with me. I'm just uh, a guy who collates other good biographies and uh, shares hopefully the best snippets of those, puts them together uh, for your enjoyment. And so tonight uh, I will be I'm taking from uh, Daniel D uh, David Donnell, who is one of the biographers of William Tyndale, a very good biographer. Uh, John Piper has done a biography on Tyndale. Joel Beakey and Michael Reeves. So you might hear uh, different portions from each of uh, their work on these kinds of things. But I just want to begin by uh, giving credit so you don't think that, you know, I'm some Tyndale scholar. Um, let, me, let me introduce Tyndale to us by giving you a snapshot from the end of his life. In 1531, five years before his death, Tyndale has been exiled from his homeland of England for seven years. And King Henry VIII is angry with Tyndale because he has been promoting Martin Luther Reformation teachings. But in particular, king, uh, the king was angry because of a book that Tyndale had written called An Answer to Sir Thomas More. Now, Thomas More was a staunch Roman Catholic. He had a hatred for all things Reformation, all things Luther, all things Tyndale. And Thomas More was the Lord Chancellor who actually helped Henry VIII write his repudiation of Luther, which was a book called The Defense of the Seven Sacraments. And Thomas More developed a rabid hatred for Tyndale. He wrote three quarters of a million words of excoriating criticism against Tyndale. And to put that into perspective for you, that's about 187 sermons he directed solely towards criticizing Tyndale. Well, in 1531, he's 37 years old, he's exiled uh, from England, he's on the continent. A man named Stephen Vaughan was sent to find Tyndale and to inform him that King Henry VIII desired him to come back to England out of exile. The king's message included the words, The king's royal majesty is inclined to mercy, pity, and compassion. And Tyndale was moved to tears. Uh, Tyndale was genuinely grieved that he had been exiled from his homeland for the sake of the Bible. But in the response that this uh, messenger Vaughn wrote back to the king, he said about Tyndale these simple words. I find him always singing one note. And he includes the words of Tyndale in this response back to the king. This is what Tyndale told him to report. He said, I assure you. If it would stand the king's most gracious pleasure to grant only a bare text of scripture, that is, the bare text alone with no explanatory notes, if the king would grant this to be put forth among his people, like as is put forth among the subjects of the emperor in these parts and of other Christian princes, I shall immediately make faithful promise never to write more, nor abide two days in these parts, but immediately to repair unto his realm and there most humbly submit myself at the feet of his royal majesty, offering my body to suffer what pain or torture, yea, what death his grace will, so that this translation be obtained. Until that time, I will abide the asperity of all chances, whatsoever shall come, and endure my life in as many pains as it is able to bear and suffer. That was the one note of William Tyndale. To see the Bible translated from Greek and Hebrew into the common English tongue so that the common person could read God's word. And if the king would grant this, he would return. But if he would not, he would gladly suffer and die that that translation be obtained. And that's exactly what happened. The king refused, and Tyndale never again returned in this life to his homeland. Tyndale, let me, let me back up uh, to the beginning of his life. Tyndale was born in 1494 in a small English town called Gloucestershire. Uh, he died in 1536, so he dies when he's 42 years old. He was a contemporary of Luther. If you remember, Luther born in 1483, just about. He's a little bit younger uh, than Luther, uh, though we don't know for sure if they ever met. Um, 
So fast forward, he's born in 1494. Fast forward to 1516. I'm not going to give you much tonight about his early life, but focus on his labors of translating the Bible. 1516, a man named Desiderius Erasmus, right? How many of us here have heard of Erasmus? Okay, his first name, not as much well-known, probably Desiderius. Erasmus is an incredible scholar. Uh, he is an upstanding member of the Roman Catholic Church. In 1516, he publishes the Greek New Testament. This is the same Erasmus that went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Luther over the bondage of the will. He publishes the Greek New Testament. And Erasmus thought this would be a good idea, that this would be a good thing for Rome. Uh, he thought that certainly a bit of Bible study would help to improve the morality of the church. Uh, certainly it would help to improve the morality of the people, maybe revive a general commitment to the Roman Catholic religion. He certainly did not anticipate that it would cause a reformation like it did. And ironically, he dedicated that publication of the Greek New Testament to none other than the Pope himself. <laughs> and the Pope gladly accepted it. Um, the publication, Erasmus' publication of the Greek New Testament was like the devil hanging himself. Um, he released the most dangerous thing to the work of Satan, which is the Word of God. When the Greek New Testament was published for the first time uh, for general consumption by the, uh, the priesthood in the Roman Catholic Church, it bypassed the official Bible of the Church, which was the Latin Vulgate. And if you know anything about the Latin Vulgate, you know that embedded into that translation is Roman Catholic doctrine. Things like penance and priests, the idea of the priesthood, uh, confession, things like that. Well, the New Testament in Greek gets released, bypasses the Vulgate, and uncovers the bare word of God as the apostles had written it. And it absolutely set fire to Europe. Um, Luther translated it into his famous German version in 1522. Uh, and within a few years, there were translations from the Greek into almost every European vernacular. Well, young William Tyndale, every day, who at this point was an ordained Catholic priest, it's amazing how many of the reformers were themselves Catholic priests, he's reading the Greek New Testament, and every day he's seeing more clearly these Reformation truths. Um, specifically, the truths of justification by faith and the errors of the papacy. And, as a result, increasingly, he's making himself suspect, as any good reformer eventually does. Um, in 1522, so he's 28 years old, he is offered the job to be the tutor in a wealthy Roman Catholic house of a man named John Walsh. Uh, John Walsh owned a massive estate, and during the week, Tyndale's job was to tutor the children with, within the household. But on Sundays, they would allow Tyndale to preach in the little chapel behind the mansion. And Tyndale began to preach with great clarity and authority against the errors of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, sometimes when men are great scholars, which Tyndale was uh, an incredible scholar, very gifted by God, sometimes they tend to be more timid in, in the pulpit. That wasn't true of Tyndale. Tyndale was a scholar, and he was not a timid man in the pulpit. And he began to be invited to preach at other churches in surrounding towns, and people began to talk about this priest who is calling out the Roman Catholic Church. Um, in fact, he was causing such a stir that the church itself sent other priests to kind of follow Tyndale. And whatever churches he would preach at, they would go and try to preach after him and try to undo what Tyndale had said. And uh, they did this by uh, calling him a heretic and threatening anyone. If you take Tyndale's doctrines to heart, you will be excommunicated uh, from the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, from the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, this naturally began to cause tensions for Tyndale in the Walsh household. Um, Walsh, as I say, was a very wealthy man. He would often have learned men over for dinner. And Tyndale would be invited to dinner. And what would Tyndale do? He would start to talk and discuss the things that he'd been reading in the Greek New Testament. And uh, what Tyndale had to say was enough to put even the, to take away the appetite of even the strongest Roman Catholics. Um, John Fox tells us that one day, he, Tyndale, got a Roman Catholic priest so exasperated with what he was saying that um, this, uh, or excuse me, Catholic scholar, that this scholar burst out in the middle of dinner, um, we would be better off without God's law than without the Pope's law. 
And it's to that that Tyndale utters his now famous words. I defy the Pope and all his laws. And if God spare my life before many years, I will cause a boy that drives the plow to, more, to know more of the scripture than you do. And that was not an empty boast. God in his grace enabled uh, his servant to accomplish that goal in his earthly pilgrimage. So he leaves the Walsh estate and he seeks the help of a bishop to help him translate the New Testament. A bishop who in a moment is going to be very important. To, his name is uh, Tunstall. And he thought, certainly, this uh, bishop in London would be happy to help me translate the Greek New Testament into English. But Tunstall told Tyndale, there's no room in this palace for translating the New Testament. And so instead, Tyndale finds safety in the house of a wealthy man named Humphrey uh, Monmouth. And this man, again a wealthy man, supported Tyndale while he began working on his translation. And during his stay, Tyndale would preach at St. Dunstan's Church uh, in London, and people began to come from all over to hear uh, Tyndale preach because he preached in a way that people could actually understand the message. But right as his translation work was getting going, uh, severe persecutions broke out against anyone who would dare to read the scriptures, let alone anyone who would dare to translate uh, the scriptures, and also, there was persecution against anyone who was caught reading the works of the reformers, right? So Luther and others are starting to cause a stir. And so Tyndale is forced to flee uh, his home country of England, and he flees on a boat to Germany. Little does he know he'll never return. And so he gets on a boat, he goes to Germany, he lands in Hamburg, and he eventually makes it to a place called Cologne in 1525. And it's there that he finds the first printer who is willing to help him print uh, the first New Testament. Uh, but when they had only printed the first two, 22 chapters of Matthew, so they're just very early in on, on the project of printing the New Testament, unbeknownst to them, an enemy of the Reformation catches word that someone's trying to print the New Testament that's going on in Cologne. And by this man pretending to be friendly to the cause, he makes friends with some of these reformers, and he finds out where the printing is going on. Well, the next morning, the building is surrounded by enemies, and they seize the printing press. But Tyndale somehow had been tipped off beforehand, and he had managed, with his friend, to gather up as many of the manuscripts as they had printed. And uh, he fled to, to Worms, um, Worms, which is the heart of Lutheranism. If you're taking notes, Worms is, we spell it like Worms, W-O-R-M-S. Um, Worms might be a familiar place to you because it was there that just five years before Tyndale gets there that Luther uh, made his famous Here I Stand speech. That was in Worms. And so Tyndale flees to the heart of Lutheranism, uh, Luther, yeah, Lutheranism and uh, that's where he finishes up his translation and he finishes up the printing of the New Testament and he begins to smuggle the New Testament um, back into England on ships hidden in uh, ships carrying cloth, and they would hide the Bibles in the cloth rolls. And uh, this, is, this is where the, the providence of God is fascinating. Um, I mentioned Tyndale was born and raised in Gloucestershire. Uh, it's a little port town uh, in England, and it was a cloth working town. That's what they did. And so he had connections, and so he was able to uh, make connections with men coming out of Germany to sneak the Bibles onto the boat, and when they arrived in England to smuggle the Bibles off the boat. Um, and the Bibles started to secretly make their way into England and even all the way uh, into Scotland. Now, obviously this was not welcomed by all. Um, by October of 1526, the, the book, the, the New Testament, had been banned by Bishop Tunstall in London. Remember, that's the same bishop he had sought help from to translate the New Testament. Tunstall does not like the New Testament being translated into English. Uh, it's banned. He contacts all the bookstores, tells them uh, to keep an eye out, and if any of them are found, to confiscate them. And uh, here's a funny story. Uh, this, this is a, just God's providence in terms of bringing good out of evil. Um, Bishop Tunstall decides that the best way to stop the spread of the Bibles is to buy them all and to burn them all. And so Tunstall hires a man named Augustine Packington. Uh, this man was a merchant who knew, knew Tyndale. And uh, he hires uh, Packington to buy all the copies of the New Testament that Tyndale had. 
And Bishop Tunstall is an extremely wealthy man, and he tells Packington, don't worry about the price, just buy them. <laughs> so Packington finds Tyndale, and we actually have a snippet of their conversation. This is how it went. Packington finds Tyndale, and he says, William, I know you're a poor man and have many New Testaments for sale. You've endangered yourself and your friends for these and have given all your money to this cause. I have found a merchant who's willing to buy all of your New Testaments. And Tyndale asks, well, who's the merchant? And Packington answers, the Bishop of London. And Tyndale answers, but they'll be burned. They'll burn them. And Packington answers, this is true. And amazingly, Tyndale agrees. And this is what he says. He says, it is good. That way, I will get money to get myself out of debt, and the whole world will cry out against the burning of the word of God. And with the money I receive, I will make a better edition of the New Testament. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Uh, the Bibles were bought. They were brought to London. Bishop Tunstall makes a massive, big deal out of it. He preaches a public sermon uh, about how many supposed errors he has found in Tyndale's translation. And he claims he's found 2,000 errors. What's funny about that is it's actually Tunstall's ignorance. Tunstall is comparing Tyndale's translation to the Latin Vulgate <laughs> instead of the Greek New Testament. So when he says, I found 2,000 errors, he's simply making Tyndale's case. And that's the problem. That's the problem with the, the Vulgate. But he makes a big old public deal about it. Uh, he gets all the Bibles together and he burns them publicly in a huge bonfire. And Tunstall thinks he's stopped the circulation of the Bible. And pretty soon, it seems like almost overnight, it seems like for every single Bible he had burned, several more suddenly begin to turn up to replace it. And uh, this time it's an even better edition because Tyndale in the meantime had learned Hebrew, which helped him to better understand the relationship of the Old Testament and the New Testament when it quotes the Old Testament. Um, and these Bibles are now being smuggled in even greater numbers into England. Um, and also, as Tyndale said, the attention that Tunstall drew to the Bibles by burning them aroused the interest of even irreligious people. Even people who have before had no interest in the Bible, all of a sudden you start burning a book and what happens? They start taking interest, and they're buying a New Testament uh, just to see uh, kind of what all the fuss was about. Well, Tunstall's angry, of course. He's frustrated. He, he summons Packington. You know, I thought you bought all the Bibles. And Packington says, I did. I think they've used your money to print more. And uh, uh, Tunstall says, well, next time you need to buy the printing presses themselves. <laughs> it's a little bit late for that. And um, another just funny anecdote here. There, there was a man in London who worked selling the Bibles. Obviously, he couldn't just publicly sell the Bibles, and so he worked undercover in London selling Tyndale's translation. This man's caught, and he's put on trial. And when he's on trial, the judge asks him, do you know who's helping Tyndale? And this is the, the man's response. He said, the Bishop of London is doing more to help him than anyone else. <laughs> for, for the money that he paid to buy the Bibles has been used to print new ones. Uh, just a, just a, God's providence is incredible in terms of bringing good out of what wicked men mean for evil. Um, let me pause at this point, and I want to uh, slow down just for a second and talk about Tyndale's translation and his passion for translation. So that's kind of the, the beginning of his life and ministry, and we'll pick back up uh, just in a few few moments here. Uh, but let's let's talk about his translation and his passion for translation. In uh, 1534, uh, <coughs> Tyndale's translation of the New Testament, David Doniel, who again is a very good uh, biographer of Tyndale, he calls the 1534 translation the glory of Tyndale's life's work. And I think that that's true. For the first time in history, the Greek New Testament was translated into English. Now, to be sure, before this, uh, before Tyndale, there were handwritten manuscripts of portions of the Bible in English. And many of these were owed to the work of John Wycliffe and a group who followed him who were called Lollards. Lollards was a derogatory uh, term for them. And these manuscripts were from about 130 years before, so very early. Um, now the problem, though, with these earlier handwritten manuscripts is that, first of all, obviously they can't be quick, uh, copied very quickly. And so the printing press becomes massively important in the mass production of Tyndale's uh, New Testament. 
But also, those early English manuscripts were translated from the Vulgate, and so they still carried over many of the errors and the mistranslations of the Roman Catholic Church. But now with Tyndale, there's a clean translation directly from the Greek, um, and he will, for the remainder of, life, uh, remainder of his life, he won't be able to finish, but he will also translate uh, about two-thirds of the Old Testament. He'll be martyred uh, before he gets to finish the Old Testament. He will translate um, the whole Pentateuch, Genesis through um, Deuteronomy. He'll translate from Joshua through Second Chronicles and the prophet Jonah. And all of this material from Tyndale becomes the basis of what we know as the Great Bible, uh, released by uh, Coverdale uh, in 1539. It also becomes the basis of the Geneva Bible, uh, Bible, which is published in 1557. But I want us to grasp something for a second here, of the, something of the brilliance of Tyndale's translation. Um, it is nothing short of literary and theological genius. Uh, Tyndale knew eight languages, and he could speak them all fluently. Um, so, uh, some of us in this room might be bilingual. Um, that's pretty good in our day. He knew fluently eight languages. He knew Latin, Greek, German, French, Hebrew, Spanish, Italian, and English. And his gift for language and his theological precision gave us, without exaggeration, not only an English Bible, but a new English language. Um, Luther's translation of the Bible in 1522 into German is often praised as not just giving the German people a Bible, but giving them a new German language. And David Daniel argues that the same should be said for Tyndale and his impact upon English. Um, Daniel, here's a quote from him. In Tyndale's Bible translations, his conscious use of everyday words without inversions in a neutral word order and his wonderful ear for rhythmic patterns gave to English not only a Bible language, but a new prose, close quote. Now, another ironic thing about this is a lot of this can be traced and can be credited back to Erasmus. <laughs> Erasmus is uh, 28 years older than Tyndale. Uh, he will actually die the same exact year Tyndale dies. Tyndale's a martyr of the Roman Catholic, killed by the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Erasmus will die a member of good standing in the Roman Catholic Church. But as I say, Erasmus, even though spiritually speaking he's not a Christian, uh, was not converted. He was a brilliant scholar, and especially when it came to the area uh, of linguistics. And uh, we, uh, in fact, uh, Erasmus taught Greek at Cambridge, the same school that Tyndale later went to. We don't know if they actually ever met personally. Uh, Tyndale attended about five years after Erasmus had already left uh, the university. But um, here's here's my point here. That's kind of all uh, just side information about Erasmus. Uh, Erasmus wrote a book called Decopia, uh, De Copia, we get our word copiousness from it, um, that Tyndale no doubt used in his school uh, as a student at Oxford, and it was a book that helped students increase their abilities to exploit the copious potential of language. It was a hugely influential book. Um, the aim was to keep language from just declining into kind of uncreative, boring, colorless speech. So let me give you an example from this, uh, this book. This would have been one of the practice exercises for the student working through Erasmus's De Copia. Uh, here, here's one, one homework assignment. Give no fewer than 150 ways of saying your letter has delighted me very much. So that's an assignment. Go home and find 150 ways to say your letter has delighted me very much. You, you can understand that students that are working in that kind of way, understanding the uh, uh, fluidness of language and the many ways in which it can be crafted. It's not surprising that it's that uh, kind of educational world that gives rise to William Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare is born in 1564, and Shakespeare is known as being unparalleled in his use of copiousness in language. Uh, in fact, one person said, without Erasmus, no Shakespeare. Well, Tyndale is right in that same camp. Let me give you a sampling of uh, English phrases, and this is really just a small sampling that we owe to Tyndale, and we don't even realize that we owe it to Tyndale. Um, I'll, I'll read these. I won't give the Bible verses. Most of them you'll recognize where they're from. But all of these, if you know another language, by the way, you know that these could be translated a different way, and these just highlight uh, the precision and the uh, rhythmic ear, as Danielle said, that Tyndale had. Let there be light. Um, am I my brother's keeper? 
The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be merciful unto thee. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There were shepherds abiding in the field. Uh, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The signs of the times, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, he went out and wept bitterly. A law unto themselves. In him we live and move and have our being. Fight the good fight. Uh, and I could go on and on. Um, according to Danielle, the list of such near, this is his quote, the list of such near proverbial phrases is endless. And he says 500 years after his great work, newspaper headlines are quoting Tyndale, though unknowingly, and he has reached more people than Shakespeare. It's, it's estimated, and this, this is an amazing statistic, it's estimated that 75% of the King James translation is Tyndale. 75%. That's one man. Uh, almost, I think all Bible translations done today are done by committees, entire committees. This man translated two-thirds of the Bible so well that his translations have endured until today. And they have not been improved upon, except maybe to update some of the more you know, modern language. Um, but there's something else that uh, drove Tyndale's passion for translation, the second thing. Not only a giftedness with language, but a theological conviction that the gospel had been hidden by Rome and needed to be understood by the people themselves. Um, in one of those dinners years before that I mentioned with the Walsh family when they'd have company over, in one of those dinners, um, Mrs. Walsh sincerely asked Tyndale, why should I believe you over these men that have such learning? And Tyndale realized it's not me that the people need to believe. It's God that the people need to believe. But they have no idea what God has said because Rome has lost the gospel and has kept the gospel hidden in the Latin Vulgate. Um, Tyndale was driven to translate the Bible for the sake of the gospel. Um, and Tyndale was firmly on the side of the reformers when it came to his understanding of the gospel. When it came to his understanding of man's depravity, uh, when it came to his understanding of God's sovereign grace in Christ, um, he despised the idea of a earthly priest that could forgive sins. And Tyndale believed the only way people are going to get converted is not by going to church and sitting through a Latin service that they can't even understand. The only way they're going to get converted is if they are confronted by God himself in his word and they hear what God says about their sinful state before him and the perfection of Christ that can deliver them. Um, let me give you some quotes, just to give you a taste of, uh, of Tyndale's theology. Um, for instance, he said things like this about man's natural state, this natural sinful state. You, you decide which side of the divide he's on with Luther and Erasmus on the bondage of the will. He said, quote, Our will is locked and knit faster under the will of the devil than could a hundred thousand chains bind a man to oppose. He said, because by nature we are evil, therefore we both think and do evil, and are under vengeance under the law, convict to eternal damnation by the law, and are contrary to the will of God in all our will, and in everything we consent to the will of the fiend. Um, it's that kind of view, that low view of the natural man's condition and human sinfulness that then sets the stage for Tyndale's grasp of the glory of God's sovereign grace in the gospel. Um, Erasmus and Thomas More with him, um, as I said before, they, they did not see the depth of the human condition. Uh, Erasmus thought, let's release the, the Greek New Testament because maybe it'll be good for a little moral improvement uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. And thus, because they don't understand man's fallenness and his desperate need of the grace of God, they did not see the same glory that the reformers saw in the pages of the New Testament. Uh, John Piper says, and he's quoting, or he's using Mark Twain's phrase here. He said, to walk from Erasmus to Tyndale is to move from a lightning bug to a lightning bolt. Uh, David Donnell puts it like this. He says, something in the Enchiridion is missing. The Enchiridion was a book that, um, that Erasmus had written that became one of his most popular works. He said, something in the Enchiridion is missing. It's a masterpiece of humanist piety, 
But the activity of Christ in the Gospels and his special work of salvation so strongly detailed there and in the epistles of Paul is largely missing. And then he says this, Christologically, where Luther thunders, Erasmus makes a sweet sound. What to Tyndale was an impregnable stronghold feels in the Enchiridion like a summer pavilion. In other words, where Luther and Tyndale are blood burners about our, our, our dreadful state and condition before God and the glories of salvation in Christ, Erasmus and Thomas More joked and banter. And, and that's not an exaggeration. Uh, some of you might know from reading uh, the biographies of Luther, when Luther published the 95 Theses, um, in 1517, Erasmus got a copy of them and sent them to Thomas More, along with, quote, a jocular letter, I mean joking, a, a jocular letter including the anti-papal games and witty satirical uh, diatribes against the abuses within the church, which, which both of them love to make. So Erasmus grabs the 95 Theses, he sends it off to Thomas More, and in a side letter, just starts laughing about all the jokes that, yeah, Luther's seen this, we've seen this for years, and they're joking about it. What, what Tyndale, or excuse me, what Erasmus sees as funny, Luther and Tyndale see as heaven and hell being on the line. And so what drove Tyndale to seeing his one note all his life was a rock-solid conviction that all humans are in bondage to sin. They, they are dead, blind, damned, helpless, and that God has acted in Christ to provide salvation by grace through faith. And that it is this, Tyndale believed, that lays hidden and obscured in the Latin scriptures and the church system of penance and merit. And therefore, the Bible must be translated for the sake of the life-giving gospel. Uh, let me give you just a, a few more quotes here just to kind of whet your appetite to go do some more reading on Tyndale. One of the things that amazes me um, and struck me as I uh, was doing some reading on Tyndale is how Tyndale and, and Luther are, in their early days at least, you know, far apart. It's not like they're close friends. And the providence of God in the Reformation is both of them suddenly have access to the same Greek New Testament. And in their early days, they are both writing incredibly good, precise, theological understandings of the gospel. And there are times when you would read Tyndale and you'd think, that's Luther that wrote that. But it's not Luther, it's Tyndale, and it's not because Tyndale got it from Luther, it's because Tyndale's reading the same Greek New Testament that uh, Luther was reading. But listen to this very, what I would call a mature and nuanced theology of the gospel. Uh, he wrote, quote, By grace we are plucked out of Adam, the ground of all evil, and we are grafted into Christ, the root of all goodness. In Christ God loved us, his elect and chosen, before the world began, and reserved us unto the knowledge of his Son and of his holy gospel. And when the gospel is preached to us, it openeth our hearts and giveth us grace to believe, and putteth the Spirit of Christ in us. And we know him as our Father most merciful, and consent to the law, and love it inwardly in our heart, and desire to fulfill it, and we sorrow when we do not. It's an incredible statement about the gospel. And at the center of all this is the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Um, let me just give you a couple quotes by him talking about faith. And he said, "By faith we are saved. Or excuse me. By faith are we saved only in believing the promises. And though faith be never without love and good works, yet it is not. Yet is not our saving imputed neither to love nor unto good works, but unto faith only." Um, he says. Faith, the mother of all good works, justifies us before we can bring forth any good work, just as the husband marries his wife before he can have any lawful children by her. Um, incredible the way that God opened up and revealed, illuminated the scriptures to Tyndale. But Rome wanted nothing to do with it. Um, Rome saw this as dangerous and hazardous to the church's well-being, and they were right. Uh, let's pick up our history of Tyndale. We'll finish with his ministry and his martyrdom. Um, first of all, to set the stage, in 1401, so Tyndale was born in 1494, uh, so almost 100 years before that. In 1401, Parliament passed what was called the Law de Heretico Comburendo. It means on the burning of heretics. And what that passing meant was it made heresy 
punishable by burning people alive at the stake. And in particular, Bible translators were in view. Seven years later, 1408, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Arundel, created what are called the Constitutions of Oxford that said this. It is a dangerous thing, as witnesseth blessed St. Jerome, to translate the text of the Holy Scripture out of one tongue and into another. For in the translation, the same sense is not always easily kept. We therefore decree and ordain that no man hereafter by his own authority translate any text of the Scripture into English or any other tongue, and that no man can read any such book in part or in whole. Those two laws passed together meant that you could be burned alive by the Catholic Church simply for reading the Bible in English. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, there's a dramatist named John Bale who records that as a boy at 11 years old, watching the burning of a young man in Norwich for possessing the Lord's Prayer in English. Uh, John Fox writes, um, Seven Lawlers, remember those are the followers of Wycliffe, Seven Lawlers burned at Coventry in 1519 for teaching their children the Lord's Prayer in English. Tyndale hoped to escape that condemnation by seeking, right? It, it said, unless you get official authorization. So that's why he sought the authorization. But obviously, uh, they wanted nothing to do with that. He got no such thing, and so he has to flee uh, in order to translate the New Testament and the Old Testament. And as time goes on, and as Tyndale's New Testament and his books, he was also a writer of several books, very good books. Um, one is The Obedience of a Christian Man. Um, a second is probably his most well-known, the parable of, uh, of the wicked mammon. That's his magnum opus on justification by faith alone. Um, as his New Testament and his books began to circulate, Tyndale began to feel the pain of seeing young men burned alive who were converted, reading his translation and his books. Um, his closest friend, his best friend, John Frith, was arrested in London and tried by Thomas More himself. And he was burned alive July 4th, 1531, at the age of 28. Uh, Richard Bayfield uh, was the man who ran the ships for Tyndale from the continent back to England and who would hide them in the, the bales of cloth. Um, he was betrayed uh, by a friend and he was arrested. And Thomas More wrote on December 4th, 1531, that Bayfield, quote, Bayfield, the monk and apostate, was well and worthily burned in Smithfield. Uh, three weeks later, the same end came to John Tewksbury. He was converted reading Tyndale's parable of the wicked mammon, which, as I said, is his defense of justification by faith alone. He is whipped in Thomas More's garden. Uh, he has his brow squeezed with small, tight ropes until blood came out of his eyes. Then he was sent to the tower where he was racked. If you're familiar with the rack, it's a torture device where they tie ropes to your arms and your legs and they just slowly stretch you until your body dislocates from itself and you become lame. And he was racked until he couldn't walk and at last they burned him alive. And Thomas More writes, quote, He rejoiced that his victim was now in hell where Tyndale is like to find him when they come together. Four months later, James Bainham followed in the flames of April uh, 1532. Uh, he stood up at a mass uh, at St. Augustine's Church in London and he lifted up a copy of Tyndale's New Testament and he pleaded with the people in the congregation to die rather than to deny the word of God. And in doing so, he signed his death warrant. Um, add to that Thomas Bilney, Thomas Duskate, John Bent, Thomas Harding, Andrew Hewitt, Elizabeth Barton, and others. All burned alive for sharing the views of William Tyndale about the scriptures and the Reformed faith. Why the hostility? That's a fair question to ask. Why the hostility? And I, I agree with John Piper that I think that there were surface reasons that were given, but there were deeper, real reasons for why the church was so opposed to an English Bible. Um, the surface reasons that would have been given were reasons like this. The English language, they said, is rude. And it's unworthy of the exalted language of the, of the Word of God. And also, they would say, when one translates, errors can creep in, and so it's just safer not to translate. Um, moreover, they said, if the Bible is in English, every man will become his own interpreter. Many will go astray into heresy and be condemned. And so it's better just to let the church interpret the Bible for you. 
And lastly, they would say that there's a special sacrament of value that actually comes through the Latin Mass. Uh, and uh, they actually believe that the service given in Latin had a peculiar grace that was communicated through it. Those are the kinds of things that they would have said on the surface for why they opposed the English Bible. But there were deeper reasons that I think are the, the more true reasons that they opposed the English Bible. One is doctrinal and one is ecclesiastical. First of all, doctrinally, the church realized if the Bible gets translated into English from the Greek and the Hebrew, there will be certain doctrines that we will not be able to show the people are actually in the Bible. And it will be exposed that the Roman Catholic Church has taught a lot of things that cannot actually be defended. And secondly, an ecclesiastical concern was if that were to happen, they realized that their power and control not only over the people but even over the state would be lost if certain doctrines were shown not to be in the scriptures, especially doctrines like the priesthood and purgatory and penance. Um, Thomas More's criticism of Tyndale can be basically boiled down to the, main, to, the, to the way that Tyndale translated five Greek words in the New Testament. Uh, he translated presbyteros as elder instead of priest. And those of you who know Greek, you know that there is a word in Greek for priest, and it's not presbyteros. It's a very different word. Um, so he brings presbyteros into English as elder, not as priest. He translates ecclesia as congregation rather than church. He translates metanoeo uh, as repent, not do penance. He translates ex homilego as acknowledge and admit rather than confess. And he translates agape as love rather than charity. And David Daniel comments here, I think, helpfully. He says, Tyndale cannot possibly have been unaware that those words in particular undercut the entire sacramental structure of the thousand-year church throughout Europe, Asia, and North Africa. It was the Greek New Testament that was doing the undercutting. And with the doctrinal undermining of these ecclesiastical pillars of priesthood and penance and confession, the pervasive power and control of the church collapsed. England would not be a Catholic nation. The Reformed faith would flourish there in due time. Close quote. Now, as we uh, make our way towards a close tonight, uh, let me just briefly talk about what it cost Tyndale to translate the Bible. All of these sufferings, and his life was a life of continual suffering. All of these sufferings, watching his friends burned at the stake, came to a climax on May 21st, 1535. Um, right in the midst of his great Old Testament translation labors, um, we get, a, we get a, a sense of the ugliness of what happened in the words of uh, Daniel again. He says, quote, Malice, self-pity, villainy, and deceit were about to destroy everything. These evils came to the English house in Antwerp wholly uninvited in the form of an egregious Englishman, Henry Phillips. And Henry Phillips is uh, very much like Judas. Uh, Phillips was a deceitful man who won Tyndale's trust and uh, pretended to be a very close friend for, with Tyndale for months, and then when the time was right, betrayed him. John Fox records how it happened. I'll read John Fox's summary. He says, When it was dinner time, Master Tyndale went forth with Phillips, and at the going forth of Point's house was a long, narrow entry so that two could not go in a front. So two, it's so narrow, two people can't walk side by side. Mr. Tyndale tried to, have put, tried to put Phillips before him, but Phillips would in no wise, but instead put Master Tyndale before, for he pretended to show great humanity. And so Master Tyndale, being a man of no great stature, went before, and Phillips, a tall, comely person, followed behind him who had set officers on either side of the door upon two seats, who being there might see who came in the entry, and coming through the same entry, Phillips pointed his finger, right, he's standing behind Tyndale as they're walking, Phillips pointed his finger over Master Tyndale's head down to him, that the officers who sat at the door might see that it was he whom they should take. Then they took Tyndale and brought him to the emperor's attorney, or procurator general, where he, where he died. Then came the procurator general to the house of points where they were staying, and he sent away all that was there of Master Tyndale's, as well as his books and other things. And from thence, Tyndale was had to the castle of Vilford, 18 English miles from Antwerp, and there he remained until he was put to death. And so for the next 18 months, he stays in Vilford Castle. 
Uh, the official charge brought against him was heresy. It was not agreeing with the Holy Roman Emperor. In a nutshell, it was for being a Lutheran. Um, a four-man commission from the Roman Catholic Center of Louvain was authorized commission to interrogate Tyndale and to prove that he's a heretic. Um, one of these men named Latimus filled three books with his interactions with Tyndale. And during those interactions, Tyndale also wrote a book himself in prison uh, to defend his, quote, chief doctrinal standard. And it was called Sola Fides Justifica Aprud Deum. Faith alone justifies before God. That was his last book. That was the key issue for Tyndale in the end. The evil and the key issue for the Roman Catholic Church. The evil of translating the Bible in their eyes came down to that issue of are we justified by faith alone. Um, these months that he spent in prison were not easy months. They were basically a long dying that ended in his death. Um, we get one glimpse, that's all we have, into the prison, into his prison stay, to see Tyndale's condition and his passion. He wrote one letter that we know of in September 1535. Um, it seems that there was a lull in the examination, so he was able to write. And this letter was addressed to an unnamed officer of the castle. And I'll read for you here a condensed version of the letter. He writes, I beg your lordship and that of the Lord Jesus that if I am to remain here through the winter, you will request the commissary to have the kindness to send me from the goods which he has of mine a warmer cap. For I suffer greatly from cold in the head and am afflicted by a perpetual catarrh, that's an issue of mucus, which is much increased in the cell. A warmer coat also, for this which I have is very thin, a piece of cloth also to pack my leggings. My overcoat is worn out, my shirts are also worn out. He has a woolen shirt if he will be good enough to send it. I have also with him leggings of thicker cloth to put on above. He has also warmer nightcaps. And I ask to be allowed to have a lamp in the evening. It is indeed wearisome sitting alone in the dark. But most of all, and mark those words. Uh, this is like Paul when he says, bring the parchments. He says, but most of all, I beg and beseech your clemency to be urgent with the commissary, that he will kindly permit me to have a Hebrew Bible, a Hebrew grammar, and a Hebrew dictionary, that I may pass the time in that study. In return, may you obtain what you most desire, so that it may be for the salvation of your soul. But if there be any other decision that has been made concerning me to be carried out before winter, I will be patient, abiding the will of God, to the glory of the grace of my Lord Jesus Christ, whose spirit, I pray, may ever direct your heart. Amen. Signed, W. Tyndallus. We don't know if any of those requests were granted to him. We do know that he stayed in prison through the winter. Um, and his verdict was sealed the next year in August. 1536. August of the coming year, he's formally condemned as a heretic. He's degraded from the priesthood, and they put on the garments, and they stripped, because he had been a priest, they stripped them off. He was degraded from the priesthood. And then in early October, tradition, we don't know the exact date. Traditionally, we celebrate it as October the 6th. Um, in early October, after 500 days in prison, he was tied to the stake and then strangled with a chain by the executioner. And then his body was burned to ashes. And his last words before being strangled were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. He was 42 years old, never married, never buried. As Hebrews says, he was one of whom the world was not worthy. And uh, I just, let me just close by saying, Christian, your English Bible and the faith that we confess comes to us on a river of blood. Uh, the blood of the martyrs who believed Christ's cause is more important than their worldly comfort and even their very lives. And this is one of the reasons Christian biography is so vital for the life of the church, not just in our day, but in any day, where we can look to those, as Hebrews says, who spoke the word of God to us, that we might imitate their faith. Uh, we, we get so caught up in the, uh, we're like the frog in the pot, and Things just, we think, go on like they always have been. And uh, it's not until we break out of our own time period and we read of the faithfulness of men and women who've gone before us that we're really challenged of how
How sold out for Christ am I? What cost am I really willing to endure for the glory of God and the spread of the gospel? Let me, let me close by reading a letter, uh, just a brief portion, that Tyndale wrote to one of his friends before his friend was to be martyred. Um, he writes to his uh, close friend, Your cause is Christ's gospel, a light that must be fed with the blood of faith. If when we be buffeted for well-doing, we suffer patiently and endure, that is thankful with God, for to that end we are called. For Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps, who did no sin. Hereby we have perceived love, that he laid down his life for us. Therefore we ought to be able to lay down our lives for the brethren. Let not your body faint. If the pain be above your strength, remember, whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, I will give it to you. And pray to our Father in that name, and he will ease your pain. Short. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the long line of godly men and women that in your providence you have raised up throughout the history of the church. Lord, your workings in history are amazing. The testimonies of your faithfulness to your gospel going to the ends of the earth. Lord, even the darkness of uh, the Roman Catholic Church, which had dominated for nearly a thousand years, could not keep the light of the gospel under a bushel. Uh, Lord, we praise you for your goodness and how you have committed yourself to preserving the scriptures. You have committed yourself to preserving the gospel of your son as you have committed it uh, to the writing of your word. Lord, we thank you that you, in the lives of men like William Tyndale and Martin Luther, John Calvin, and countless others, you, by your grace, were at work to make them faithful and bold men in their generation when they needed faithful and bold men. And Lord, even as we think upon our own day today, we pray that you would be pleased to do that yet again. Lord, we see so many similarities in our day, as in the darkness of the pre-Reformation days. We see such an indifference to your word. Uh, we see, Lord such a lack of interest in true religion and Christianity. Lord, we see false teaching abounding. We see false teachers go unchallenged. And your gospel, Lord, uh, it is uh, seldom that we hear it faithfully preached from the pulpits in our day. We, we pray, Lord, that you might be pleased to raise up good and godly and faithful, bold and courageous men, that you would raise up pastors who are willing to endure the cost and to suffer for the sake of Christ, just as Christ has suffered for us, leaving us an example. Lord, we pray that you would revive your church in our day. We pray that you would pour out your spirit upon Bethany, but not only upon Bethany, but upon every true church that preaches the gospel. And Father, we pray for a move of your spirit, for revival in the hearts of your people, that there might be a renewal in zeal for doctrine, a renewal and zeal for experiential godly living in our homes and in our societies, and Lord, a, a zeal to see your word translated and brought to those places that have never heard the truth and the light of the gospel. Lord, we pray you'd be gracious to us. We pray that even from our own midst, Lord, you'd be working in our hearts, convicting us perhaps of where we've been cowardly. Lord, help us to count the cost and to count the treasure of knowing Christ is far worth it. Lord, we ask for your help in these things. We truly can do nothing apart from your Son. We need the influence of your Spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would do that. We thank you again for the life, the life of this saint and the lives of all of your people uh, that are left behind for examples for us to follow and imitate their faith as they followed Christ. Lord, be with us tonight, we pray. Uh, cause us to think upon these things and to be challenged. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Just a reminder, there are, if you're interested, this year's Tyndale shirts are here, and last year's Calvin shirts are also, there's a new batch, so if you didn't get a Calvin one, and you've always wanted one, uh, 
uh, now's a chance to get in. There are free bookmarks. There's also uh, some books out there and material and things like that. Feel free to avail yourself of that. And uh, thank you all very much for coming. And uh, God bless you. And your business.